Our next speaker is Dr. Tom Lovejoy. He's university professor in the Environmental Science and Policy Department at George Mason University. He was elected to that post in 2010 and also serves as a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation. He has had an international agenda in conservation, science, and environment since he began serving as program head for the World Wildlife Fund, U.S., in 1973. In 1980, he coined the term biological diversity and produced the first projection of global extinction for the Global 2000 report to the president. He has helped bring attention to the world's tropical forests and the issue of tropical deforestation, particularly in the Brazilian Amazon where he has worked for five decades. He served as chair of the Independent Advisory Group on Sustainability within the Inter American Development Bank in 2010 and 11, and has continued to lead sustainability initiatives for that group through the past several years. He received his BS and PhD in biology from Yale University. Tom Lovejoy. Thank you. So thank you, Gary. And thank you, Rita. Uh, every time I hear the latest uh, on this ongoing quest you have to know more about cholera and how to manage it. It's, it's always a, a thrilling uh, thing. Uh, so thank you for that. So I want to talk about uh, four examples uh, where science and diplomacy intertwine. Uh, and the first of these is about diplomacy enabling science. Uh, and so this goes back about 20 years ago uh, when I was asked to chair a subcommittee of the Mega Science Projects uh, Committee of the OECD. Uh, and what was so interesting about this was instead of thinking about uh, particle accelerators or, or sort of huge telescopes, uh, those kinds of mega science projects. Uh, what this subcommittee ended up recommending was the creation of a global biodiversity information facility. And basically, the museum collections of the world, which are largely uh, in OECD countries, have an enormous amount of data uh, associated with all those specimens. Location, time, uh, and it's increasingly digitized. So all of that is now available uh, through the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, so this is an example of somebody thinking very creatively. It wasn't my idea. I just got to lead the subcommittee uh, that essentially harnessed uh, diplomacy within the OECD context uh, to establish a very important contribution uh, to the facilities and information for environmental planning worldwide. So a second example I'd like to talk about is essentially where science tells us important things about how to manage the environment. Uh, and we have to figure out how to translate that uh, through diplomacy into results. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about my favorite place in the world, the Amazon, uh, where in the mid-1970s, a Brazilian scientist named Aeneas Salati uh, demonstrated for the first time uh, that vegetation could actually affect climate. Uh, prior to that moment, the, the basic paradigm, the dogma, was that vegetation is the consequence of climate and has absolutely no influence on it. And so Aeneas Salati, by looking at oxygen isotopes and the ratios of them uh, in rainwater from the Atlantic to the Peruvian border, he didn't get quite to the Andes, uh, was able to d demonstrate unequivocally uh, that basically half of the rainfall in the Amazon is internally generated. 
Uh, so it was a, a really tremendous advance in our understanding about environmental science and not just the Amazon. So the minute one understands that there is this hydrological cycle uh, in the Amazon basin, it raises the question of at what point will deforestation cause that to unravel? Uh, and that was the initial question. Now it's, it's also affected by climate change, the use of fire, uh, and the rest. Uh, the Amazon is now about 20% deforested. Uh, and there have been two historic droughts, uh, first in 2005 and then in 2010. And I think it is likely that less moisture coming from the Amazon is actually a contributor to the drought in Sao Paulo. So what this basically says is, in the end, the Amazon has to be recognized as a system. It has to be managed as a system. And it means there has to be something approaching integrated planning and integrated management. Uh, and so that is the challenge for diplomacy because there are basically eight countries involved in all of this. Brazil has two thirds and the overall area is roughly equivalent to the 48 states, it's enormous. Uh, and Brazil is always the big uh, 800 pound gorilla in all those kinds of diplomacy and politics. Uh, but there is uh, an Amazon cooperation treaty uh, with all the right language in it that would enable one to make advances towards uh, much more thoughtful management uh, of the Amazon uh, than occurs today. Uh, and just so you don't think it's all a bad picture, more than 50% of the Amazon is now under some kind of formal protection. Uh, but anyway, that's a, a major uh, challenge uh, for science in forming uh, diplomacy. So taking it even to a larger scale, uh, to the planetary boundaries uh, work of of Johan Rockström and Will Steffen and dozens of others. Uh, a lot of people object to the term planetary boundaries because they think it implies limits. Uh, well, in a way, it doesn't imply their limits because we basically exceeded some of those uh, in rather, uh, I think, dangerous ways. Uh, but I think it is fair to say uh, that they represent the boundaries of the conditions uh, which nurtured the, raise, the rise of human civilization. So we need to think about these things very seriously. Uh, one of them is biodiversity loss, another is nitrogen, and sort of double the natural levels of biologically active nitrogen. Uh, dead zones doubling in number every decade for the last four decades. And of course, the really big one, climate change. Uh, and we're all familiar with pieces of this, but I just thought I would offer you a piece uh, which is not too widely appreciated as, as yet, uh, which is that a significant portion of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere actually comes from destruction and degradation of modern ecosystems. Uh, which means that if we do ecosystem restoration at scale, and there are all kinds of benefits that come from doing that in watershed management and better grazing, better agriculture, uh, better protection against storm surge. If we do all of that, there's probably about half a degree Celsius of climate change that we could actually avoid having happen just by sucking it back into the living system. Uh, so, and parenthetically, I should say, and I don't have time to go into it, I think the two degree target that has been agreed upon, uh, sort of not in a, 
obligatory way, but it's what everybody talks about in the negotiations. I think that's probably too high for biological systems. So the ability to take another half a degree out of that is really important. So that is a huge, gigantic uh, challenge for science diplomacy and diplomacy in general. Uh, it won't happen overnight, uh, but it's one of those kinds of things where what we do in science uh, has huge implications for diplomacy uh, and for uh, future human welfare. And then finally, I'd just like to throw out uh, a challenge for, I guess, social science research. Uh, in the sense that as, as I look at things environmentally over the course of my career, uh, I've come to the conclusion that we tend to accept increments of change uh, when in the aggregate we would reject all that change. Uh, and since most of our decision making has tended to be about the increments and trying to be reasonable, uh, I think we need to have a much better understanding of how people think about those particular kinds of issues, which are not just environmental, uh, where we can, in fact, become much more uh, effective uh, in managing our own systems. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lovejoe. My name is Alejandra Solano. I'm from the Embassy of Costa Rica. I'm Deputy Chief of Mission. I'm also the Minister Consular in Charge of Science Issues. And I have a comment question, perhaps recommendation. In Costa Rica, we have an agreement with the U.S. that is a sweat by, for nature conservancy of our forest. That means we have the second time recently where we were able to use funds to conserve our forest in Costa Rica by approved by the United States uh, funds. And also we have a local program, a program that uh, enables landowners to conserve their land in order to have some incentive from the government. So we're trying to preserve that since we have one third of our, of our land in a certain regime of protection. My question is this, the resources are scarce every time and sometimes we have to, to use diplomacy to convince other authorities that these programs are worth it because you, you mentioned a relation between climate, vegetation, conservation. My question is, where do you, what do you recommend for a, for a developing country uh, to promote these types of collaboration with, for example, the U.S. governments, when the priority seems to be getting a little further from them. Thank you. So, so my short answer to that is, I think the best way to do that is engage uh, some U.S. scientists. Uh, so you already have a collaborative plan, uh, and then go uh, and and talk to the the federal government about what they might be able to do. But let me just add, you know, thinking about that last question that I threw out, one of the great players in the world uh, in all of this has been Costa Rica, decade after decade. Uh, and more than once, as I'm talking about something Costa Rica has just done and nobody else has done before, I would hear, well, that's Costa Rica, it's a special case. Uh, and then four or five years later, it's being imitated all over the world. Uh, so Costa Rica actually plays an incredibly important role, uh, much more than uh, a diplomat from a very large country. Uh, when he was hearing me talk about Costa Rica and said, you know, the world is like a giant cake. And you, the U.S., are a big slice. And we, Brazil, whoops, I get it, <laughs> are a big slice. And Costa Rica is only a raisin. And I said, some raisin. <laughs> I 
I'm sure you're very aware of uh, the situation in Kenya with, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, I'm Marilyn Merritt from George Washington University. And um, the situation in Kenya with Wangari Maathai, it's sort of the, almost the obverse, where she just noticed that there were no rivers and that the trees weren't growing in the area that she grew up in, and she just decided to start planting trees just by herself and getting other people to plant trees and didn't make it, and it restored a lot of the earth. So that's just kind of, you know, action leading to, to something else. I'm sure you're familiar with that, but I wonder if you yeah, might so, comment on that. Yeah, so, I mean, Wangari, uh, who I had the great honor of having as a friend, uh, was, was basically, she, she was a force of nature. Uh, and she just decided that some things were awry uh, and that individuals could make a difference. And so she started a whole movement in planting trees uh, and ultimately was recognized with the Nobel Prize. We have time for one more? Yes, All right, Mr. Lovejoy, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Dennis Crawford from Colorado. And um, I enjoyed your, your delicate treatment of kind of the metaphor of the frog in hot water or put it in a freezer. So when you speak of <coughs> examples of incremental change, I was wondering if you could also give us examples of some you've considered in your career that are inspiring in terms of bold leaps forward, um, kind of on the par of what we'll be needing the next 10 years? So, so I'm going to go back to Costa Rica to give you an answer. Um, so when I started uh, at the World Wildlife Fund in 1973, Costa Rica had three parks. Uh, and the president was actually considering substantially reducing one of those or even eliminating it. Uh, but within a year or two, uh, through a collaboration between the World Wildlife Fund and the Nature Conservancy, uh, we were actually able to help in ways that led to the creation of Corcovado National Park, which many consider the crown jewel of the Costa Rican park system. Uh, so, but that turned out to be catalytic. Uh, and one thing after another has happened in Costa Rica as a consequence of all of that, uh, undoubtedly aided and abetted by Costa Rica's long tradition uh, and putting a priority on education and its long tradition of being hospitable to foreign uh, scientific collaboration. Uh, so to refer to Costa Rica as the Green Republic, uh, is actually quite appropriate. It doesn't mean it's perfect. No place is perfect. Uh, but it is an interesting example of how just dealing with one project uh, could actually begin to create uh, the change that leads, leads to an aggregate plus. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.